which and whose voices are that that is driving this change and so on uh, we both had big conversations about you know topics like distribution of power etc uh, but we also have been touching on what does that mean for yourself and the and how you can become a part of that change so i'm really looking forward to hearing iris the empathias walk us through some of their thoughts uh, and what I think will be an interactive conversation about this topic uh, that hopefully can be a bit of a transition enabler for, for all of us. So over to you, to the both of you and, and thanks so much for hosting this session. Uh, great, thanks so much, Jasper and the States of Change people. Uh, hi everybody, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, we, Panthea and I, um, we hope this is, this isn't a workshop, this isn't, we're not, we're not actually here to um, put forward any recommendations or frameworks or toolkits actually in any way, shape or form. Um, from the time we actually first had this idea of doing something at States of Change, which was about like a month ago, maybe more, um, to now, everything has changed so much um, that that it also affected how we thought about our own, um, I guess, roles in, in, in the world and roles in, in the change work that we do as, as practitioners. Um, and so we thought we would reflect sort of where we are um, emotionally um, and, and intellectually um, and, um, and, and sort of have a very raw, honest conversation uh, with, 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 with people. Um, because I think that's important to have that space. So in short, um, for those that don't know me, my name is Arathi Krishnan. Um, I work in humanitarian futures and strategic foresight. I, I've been in the humanitarian and aid world um, for 15 to 18 years. Um, I have both uh, the, the, the sector and the work I do is something that I am deeply in love with, but I also have a deep, um, cynicism and, and, and a very critical lens. It's, it's a, it's a love hate relationship almost. Um, and a lot of the work that I do is working with large, uh, institutions around how to embed foresight and much more forward looking practices. Um, but, um, that, but, but what I've learned, I guess, over the last uh, few years of my practice is, is the hegemony of our work means nothing when we are not um, centering principles of equity, of justice, of inclusion into it, rather we end up just reinforcing the status quo over and over. Um, Pen, I'll, I'll stop there and, and hand over to, to, my, to my, my dear, deep collaborator and friend, uh, Panthea. Sure. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for uh, joining us. Um, yeah, I think as Arati said, we're really looking forward to a uh, open and honest dialogue with everyone and ask you to contribute um, comments and ideas and questions that you have been grappling with as well. Um, we have a loose structure that we will take all of us through, I think, um, but really look forward to being in conversation with you all. Um, so I'm the founder and executive director of, of Reboot. Um, and, I'm, and, and my background is as an ethnographer, designer, organizer and facilitator. And I usually find myself um, working primarily in the global development and sort of public social innovation spaces, uh, usually leading different uh, systems, co-creation, co-design exercises. Um, and so what that usually means is I spend a lot of time getting to know the different factions, the different unlikely allies that are being brought together, um, whether that is activists, movement leaders, government officials, um, aid agencies, whatnot, and trying to understand where everybody is coming from and how do we understand and reckon with the history of oppression and antagonism that a lot of these different actors um, sort of face and have with one another and how do we sort of recognize that and maybe not move beyond but start to think about different ways different policies solutions programs whatnot that can help us um that can help us um you know directly address and um and uh, mitigate some of the harms that we've seen and so yeah i think the past few weeks have been um the past, the past few months 2020 um has just been an experience um and so really grateful for the chance to process with you all 
Um, before we sort of get into our thread of conversation, um, we had a holding slide up earlier where we said, we're going to be bringing our truth into this conversation and, and our whole selves. Um, so what, I would, what we would love to invite you to do is maybe just take a couple of minutes and write down on a piece of paper, or you can put it into the chat about something that you're really uncertain about in how to maneuver these, these times that we're in, something that you're questioning about yourself, your practice. Um, and, and either put it, either write it in the chat or write it on a, on a piece of paper and maybe hold it up to the video. Um, I'm going to share something that I've wrote, written just to, to get us started. And I don't know if you can see it. Um, but something that I am grappling with is, have I become, um, or am, have I embraced being a model minority? And in doing so, have I normalized racism, sexism, classism in order to get to where I am um, and, and, and to achieve what I have achieved? Um, so that's my honest truth and, and where I am at today um, and something that I'm grappling with. So I'm just going to ask if, if you are able to lean in and, and obviously this is optional, um, but perhaps just, yeah, write it down on a piece of paper or maybe type it into the chat. And we're just gonna take a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and then we're just gonna use that to maybe start, start the conversation as well. Anne-Marie, that's, uh, that's certainly a question that I am grappling with as well. Yeah, yours resonates <laughs> as well. It's a really fantastic one, Georgia. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Jasper. Thank you for sharing that, everybody. Um, um, and please, you know, feel free as, as we go through the next um, 45 minutes or so to just type in some of your, I guess, um, thoughts or ideas or reflections um, um, as, as we go through it. It takes a while to sort of come to that. Um, thanks, Stuart, Kimberly. Yeah, the unlearning and relearning. Yep, Jamie, I get that. Okay, um, let's maybe get the conversation started. Um, I think one of the first things Spanthia and I were discussing was, you know, what we are seeing um, in this moment um, 
and, 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 and what do we see in all these conversations around reimagining? Um, and certainly from, from um, a perspective of, you know, in a lot of my work where, where we're asked to look at what do post-COVID futures look like? What, what is this reimagination? Is this a, a tipping point for our world? What I have found um, really interesting in this um, when everything kind of hit this year was that if we look at who was first producing all the scenario analysis, the forecasts, um, the ideas of the new normals, the, those, um, the, the, the written blog pieces, etc. The majority of them were coming from, from, from a normative group, a very dominant group. Um, and, and very often, you know, from, from majority groups, whether it's, it's, it's white, it's male, um, it's people who have had the, the time and the space to, to produce this analysis um, at a time when all of us were still trying to understand what it meant, trying to deal with the immediate repercussions. And, and you started to find that the organizations or the individuals producing scenarios analysis um, we're all coming at it from a very particular point of view and making broad based assumptions about how this was playing out in different spaces. Um, and we also saw that when, when COVID policy design was being designed in, in the North fundamentally, you know, if we, when we're thinking about what, so, what would social distancing look like. And this was then implemented um, and then just adopted without any sort of consideration about how it might play out in different country or cultural contexts, like in India or in other parts of the world where social distancing really isn't um, a, a, a viable possibility. And for me, it, it, it resonated in the fact that um, when we design in normative ways, when we implement in normative ways, when only those that are doing the reimagining or even have the platform and the space to air their ideas of what the, these, these futures might be are from dominant majority groups. We, we talk about, we, we miss, we miss how this is impacting on the rest of us and the, the very mixed identities we all wear and the very different realities um, that, that we all wear. And we often also talk about change as if, as if it's something exogenous, as if it's this thing that has to happen over there, or we have to, to, to you know, encourage groups of people or institutions to change without necessarily thinking about what, is, what do I have to do to change um, myself as, as part of that process. Um, and, and that's sort of, I guess, what I, what I wanted to share uh, from that. Um, and Panthea's got a much different narrative, I think, that she, she wants to talk about as well. Yeah, sure. Um, could also everyone just type in the chat where you're from um, or where you're, where you're from or where you're currently based? Um, would just love to get a sense of the room. Um, because I think, that, um, I think that question sort of uh, has been very, um, you know, where I'm based and where I work has been very um, at the heart of my sort of own questioning and searching lately. Um, I'm um, from Taiwan, grew up in Canada, currently based in Brooklyn, um, and have largely worked internationally. And I think um, a lot of my processing lately has, you know, Eriti and I first connected around some of our post-COVID work, um, as she was mentioning, but the last few weeks, um, being based in Brooklyn and in the U.S. have also been, I think, um, incredibly disorienting, incredibly tragic, incredibly hope-giving. Um, I think as everyone knows, on May 25th, a black man named George Floyd was murdered by four police officers in Minneapolis. And since then, protests have erupted um, all over the US. And I think everyone is aware these protests are about George Floyd. They're also about the countless black men and women that have been lost to police brutality and to systemic racism. Um, and they are also a reaction to the historical embedded structural de dehumanization that black people have suffered for too long. Um, I think you all, you all have seen the stats. Um, black Americans have died at a rate about three times that of white Americans. Um, and so you're seeing, we're seeing America go through a reckoning right now. I think the writer Jelani Cobb has talked about this as the American spring. Um, and so 
you know, with that, I actually wanted to read something. Um, by last night, I went to uh, last night I went to a, um, a gathering. Uh, I went online to a gathering of poets um, hosted by the um, the uh, I think she's Cuban Jamaican uh, poet um, Aja Monet. Folks may be familiar with her, and um, it was really beautiful. I will share the link um, afterwards. But I wanted just to share something from her voice, because I think this is actually really important for what we're, um, so if I, whoops. Uh, okay, so I'm actually on a brand new computer today, so it doesn't look like I can share my screen, um, but it's okay. Uh, the book is called, my, my, my Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. And the poem is called Daughters of a New Day. And I will say, I feel um, a little bit strange as an East Asian woman um, reading a Black woman's words right now, but um, I just want to, um, I, I, I just think it's an, an important perspective to, to bring into the conversation. So Daughters of a New Day. Rousing demonstrations across the country, globe, and minds. Protest is a petition for presence, a, dra a, a dress draping in front of a military tank. It is a black girl scaling a 30 foot pole to take down a Confederate flag. The intuitive urgency of doing whatever must be done. Tormented by willful silence, courageous voices raise and riot what cannot be killed. Fingers in the shape of a heart, a fistful of blistered blues. We take to the streets, picket signs in our blood, our ancestors marching through a nightmare. We rise toward freedom. We resist and live as if a right to be unoccupied. Embarrassing borders. State violence is as intimate as a forced kiss, busted lip, or bloodied eye. We feel it in our bones deeply. How do you matter a life? The terrain of our struggle to live, our sense of community goes deeper than who we inhabit space with. It is the sinking of bodies that never touch. Solidarity is a witnessing, the risk, the power to act. It is in the radical fight to care, to nurture what in you endures. The, the spiritual war of class, the rally for lovers to love. A trans woman dancing with herself in a crowded room for the first time is too a protest. A mother, a mother, in, a mother in, in Hebron dresses her daughter in dreams. Existence is too resistance. A Syrian father re reunited with his son on the shore of his arms is too a revolution. A frizzed South African girl full of kink and spine resting her hair in her hands is too an act of political warfare. We protest to empower personhood. More than mourning, we roar. Be not discouraged, be not dismayed, be defiant and deliberate, always be. Um, so she's really incredible. Um, I highly recommend um, her work. And I thought that was just sort of very apt for the moment because I think we are all, um, and I think in the comments, we're all doing a lot of learning and unlearning and trying to think about our role. And we are sort of, uh, we're seeing a moment of reckoning. And I think something that, um, I think something that really struck me in the past few days as I've been thinking about it, um, and I'll sort of, you know, just share one more observation with you is um, there's this uh, architect, urban planner, and uh, design justice ad, um, um, activist, um, a Black architect named Brian Lee Jr. Um, he, sa he says, America has never fully recognized racism as a complex cooperative system dependent upon its institutions, academic, political, commercial, and otherwise, to resign themselves to complicity. Rebellion is a response to a prolonged de dehumanization of a people unwilling to be participants in their own demise. And so, all, the, all of this has been swirling in, in my head as I've been um, 
marching and witnessing and supporting um, and trying to figure out um, what you know, our places, because I think the, the, the group here I, I see in front of me, we're, we're a group of professional change makers that have long professed to serve the interests, to protect the interests, to defend the interests, to advance the interests of the most marginalized among us. Um, and for all our calls for equity and justice, um, I think what many of us are reckoning with right now is what we've been working for is too incremental, too narrow, to marginalize, to slow. And I think we can look around in our sector and in our institutions um, and see, you know, uh, many of us do not have the lived experience of those that we are um, purporting and, 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 and genuinely wanting to serve. Um, but it is easier to sort of go out and, you know, I, I, I think about my own work in this, it is easier to go out to collect those stories, to write them down, to present the personas, to write the data, to write the reports, to advocate and advocate and advocate, um, than it is to really yeah, grapple with the, um, the you know, biases and racism and sexism and classism um, within the institutions that we work with. And I think this was really powerful me, uh, for me this past weekend. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I, I can't share my screen, but, um, if you just Google, you know, um, Black Trans Lives Matter uh, protests in New York, um, you, you see beautiful images of 15,000 New Yorkers showing up for Black trans women um, fighting for their rights. And, you know, in, I think, the, um, the gosh, I don't know, the, 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 the pecking order of marginalization, um, Black trans women are probably the most um, fucked over. Um, time and time and time again. And so I think to sort of see that show of solidarity, um, to see the outpouring of support uh, was really moving and incredible. And I think it sort of brought me back to our own questions or my, my own questions and my own searching around um, how have we shown up or not uh, for the most marginalized amongst us. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, what does this moment mean as we're seeing this, these global ruptures of people rightly speaking for themselves? Um, what is our role as allies and how do we do the hard work of unlearning? Um, um, and yeah, where, where, where should we stand? Um, and so this is something that I've thought a lot about because, um, you know, just in, I mean, the uh, maybe just one 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 a a anecdote, um, and then Eric, you'd be curious for your thoughts. But you know, in the in the um, I, I uh, recently moderated a panel discussion um, with a couple of senior officials in different development agencies, and I think one of um, one of the themes was, uh, or the theme of the conversation was thinking and and thinking and working politically, which. I imagine many folks in the development space are familiar with and you know people kept asking some version of the searching question um well but how do we know if we're thinking and working politically how do we know if we're doing it right and i guess if you're asking yourself the question of whether or not you're thinking and working politically you're probably not doing it um because many of the populations that we work with many of the communities that we um, live amongst don't have any choice but to think and work politically and so, you know, what does that mean that we even had the privilege to ask ourselves those questions? Um, and, you know, these are some, um, these are some things I've been, I've been grappling with. Um, thanks. You know, you said a couple of things and, I, and, I, and it's kind of resonating with me. Um, I think where I am is, is in two, maybe three spaces. Um, I am, I am, I am furious, and I've been furious for a few months now, particularly since COVID hit, for, for some of you that have may re, um, read some of my work, uh, just how we have all collectively failed. It doesn't matter which social change, whether you're doing big development, humanitarian work, or community level social change, we have failed. We have failed because people are still poor. They still, the level of, of, of poverty, of in, inequity that exists today is because we, collectively 
cannot push past or, 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 or have chosen to normalize the status quo rather than, than, than be angry about it and say, no, this, this cannot continue. I'm also really sad. I'm, I'm really sad. I'm really, I don't want to keep being the angry brown person that, 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 is, that is pushing back against this all the time. Um, but there's a part of me that goes, we've been talking about this for a really, really long time, particularly in the humanitarian and development sector. Um, someone that I deeply admire, um, that, that's very well-respected thought leader in, in this space, uh, about a week or two ago, wrote a piece around, um, is racism the reason why the humanitarian sector cannot localize its actions? Um, and it, you know, he's a white male, very well respected, huge platform, etc. And and I sat there going, well, yeah, we've been saying this for a very long time, but um, have we been listened to? Um, I think that what what infuriates me about our failures is that it is easier for us to Ex romanticize the past in a way and rather than dig deep into the inequities of the past um, and so we accept you know um, past mechanism past structures past philosophies without unpacking it to real to to understand how this as is, is, is an easier way to not then do the process the, the, the process of healing and the process of of um, um, working through it because it's easier for us to remember this as, as something wonderful, or not something wonderful, but you know, to see it through a specific lens than to see who was actually impacted or left out of it. Um, we use words like minorities, marginalized, as if this were leave no one behind, as if that's an accident. No, it's not an accident. It's because they weren't designed into it into the first place. In inequality is 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 a mission by design it's not um it's not something that that accidentally happens um and we we assume people fit in you know um panther you said that black trans women are are, are, are one of the most marginalized in, in 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 that in your context and i would agree and but often, in, particularly in the humanitarian and development space, we use these binary identities for people because it's easier for us to grapple whether you're a man, you're a woman, you're a child. And that's all we're talking about in terms of gender and diversity. And then it's a surprise when somebody has multiple identities that they've, they've flowed. Even just looking at how people are identifying themselves on the chat, you know, all of us are identifying multiple homes in which we belong. And yet then when you're looking at how we are identifying the people whom we serve or we purport to serve, we, we, we flatten their identity and their access because it's easier for us to grapple with. And there's two anecdotes. I, um, you know, someone that I worked with uh, in, in my recent history was, was rewrite, were, 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 they were struggling, they were fighting to rewrite the institutional gender policy. Um, and rather than, and then they asked me to look at it um, from, from my lens. Um, and I said, okay, we need to actually name these groups of people, it's gender and diversity policy that um, we're talking about here. And the individual turned around and said to me, no, I don't believe that, you know, this is, it's, it's, um, um, this is, it's, it's for our common humanity. It's a human right. We don't have to name everybody. And there in and of itself was the problem. It was too much trouble to name the different groups in the policy document, a person from privilege will look at, um, will only consider uh, gender and diversity and inclusion from a, you know, it's everybody's human right rather than what are people's needs and desires. And the thing is, if you read a policy document and you don't see yourself in there and you don't see yourself reflected in it, it's not a safe document for you. And so you reject that document. And so I, I find myself straddling anger and grief and sadness um, and, and frustration because even when we are reimagining these futures, we're privileging the visions from certain groups that miss these mixed identities, mixed needs and desires that, we, that don't fit into perfectly structured um, log frames or perfectly structured theories of change. Um, and and there's a lot of us that are on that 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 exist in liminal spaces in the edge spaces we don't fit into normal categories and 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 we just it's just too hard and we become complicit i suppose which is um what you know pantheo was talking about
earlier. And I guess it highlights what our practices and mental models um, really are. And I mean, I think just one, um, just one point on that, that reminds me. Um, so um, I think some folks know we've been, my team has been organizing for a few months now around an effort here, starting in New York, but trying to take it global um, around basically reimagining post COVID futures. Um, and so a lot of the work, I mean, basically there's a couple of different components to the model. And what I wanted to point out is that there is one early component of this that has been the hardest to fundraise for. Funders just want me to take it out. And it is basically the part where we are working with communities that have been long oppressed to articulate their visions and hopes of the future. And it has been astounding to me that some of our leading um, democracy systems change, civic empowerment funders um, look at this, say, you know, it's all really great, but that part around sort of community visioning, do, do you really need that? Do you really need that? It, it, it seems to, you know, take a lot of time. It seems to take a lot of money. Um, you know, don't we know what the issues are? Don't we know what the issues are? Here's a, here's a list of our grantees. Why don't, why don't you just work with our grantees? You know, the implicit, um, the implicit message being, here's a list of our grantees. Um, you know, some of the major um, civil society and NGO groups. Just, just go work with them because we have sort of vetted these ideas already. Um, and, you know, if you work with them, you're more likely to get funding from us. And I think this has been um, one of the most, it's been a really heartbreaking battle um, for me over the past couple of months um, because we have stood our ground and said, no, we are going to fight to keep this in. Um, you know, we probably shouldn't be talking to each other, but it, it, it is astounding to me that civic engagement funders and allies and supporters um, want to take out the civic engagement piece. Um, and especially when there is an overt focus on working with um, long oppressed communities. And so now that's changing. That has changed in the past couple of months as, um, and, and also actually sort of just one, one aspect of that too is uh, that civic engagement piece. There's a lot around um, working with communities to uh, articulate their visions via participatory arts. Um, via inspiring and nourishing ways of participating that don't re-traumatize communities, don't ask them to perform their pain and suffering in order to get institutional attention, and that hasn't clicked for people. But why do we need that? You know, why can't you, okay, fine, you know, why don't you just do a survey? And because the, sur the survey, we get to predefine and articulate the issues that we think are important. And then we can say, great, 70% of people agree with us. We're not giving people, you know, the, the solutions and the issues that we define are based on how we are structuring our programs, our teams, how our endowments work, what our, what our boards want. And, but that's changing in the past few weeks. Um, you know, in the US now, a lot of the proposals being discussed, um, you know, they, they sound radical at the outset, defund the police. Doesn't actually mean get rid of the police. It means reallocating the money towards community services, um, towards, um, towards housing and education and good jobs to taking care of long suffering communities so that you know, maybe we need less police in, in, in the first place. Um, abolition. <laughs> Is now being talked about as a main, main mainstream policy concept, um, you know, because of COVID. Uh, universal basic income, universal healthcare, is now being talked about in the U.S. And I think what a lot of the gatekeepers are suddenly now reckoning with and realizing is that if we don't give people meaningful ways to participate and articulate what their hopes and visions for the futures are, it is going to erupt in another way. And so now folks are scrambling to um, catch up with that and to see um, where, uh, how they can better listen. Um, so yeah, Eriti, what, what, what you're saying that just sort of really resonated with me. Um, I think the model, well, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I, I'm, I guess what I, 
you know, how do we then move this forward, right? Um, one of the things that I get really arced up about, <laughs> for those of you that know me, is when people use phrases like, okay, let's say using your example, defund the police, but like in my space, like decolonization or, you know, feminist this, or, you know, someone was made a comment, so, you know, we have to have this and we have to have affirmative action. If you don't understand what actually it means to decolonize the hard work of not just understanding the, the implications of that, but also through the process of healing that is required from that, of love and care, um, even, even if you're trying to apply a feminist lens to things, etc., then don't just throw these words out because they are the buzzwords of the day. They're not this brand that you're going to you know, tap onto something because, because it's, it's what's the, you know, cool thing to do at the moment. And that's my concern. So how do we, how do we have a much more authentic journey where we are allowing ourselves to learn from the past? Um, we're not just looking at all the privileging forces, but we're also injecting models of care and healing um, that, that we need, that we need in order to imbue change. And, and how do we not just about, you know, okay, now we're going to, you know, make sure we're designing with people of color, blah, 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 or, or people with different abilities or whatever group you're working with. How does that actually happen in a articulated conscious way so that we're not making assumptions? How do we um, check our biases as we're doing this and our blind spots? Um, do we just assume what you are capable of doing because you are a woman of color and therefore you're only capable of doing X amount? Um, when do we stop questioning that? Um, when do we bring lived experience in and stop talking about these policies as if they are these external things that have no real impact? And, you know, I come from a, from a poor family. I've worked through the grace of my mom being a single mom and working really hard to give my, see myself and my sister an education. But when you're talking about women, brown women, um, you know, that uh, you're trying to design a cap capacity building project for blah, blah, for livelihoods, et cetera, that was my grandmother. That was, my, that was that's my ancestral history in a recent ancestral history. This, this is personal. This isn't my white savior moment. How do we bring these experiences, these journeys into the mix? Um, and rather than just trying to reinforce inequity, and I guess my, the last point I, I just wanna make here, it, what kind of leadership do we need to guide us through this process? And I really, I, you know, I'd love, and I'm conscious about time, so you know, maybe we should open up to others. I would love to hear from, from everybody else. What is the leadership we need? What, what should we demand of ourselves? What should we be demanding of our own leaders? And, you know, somebody raised the point, you know, some of us are in precarious situations. How do we do it when it seems scary? Um, how do we do it without hijacking the moment? I mean, as a person, Panthe and I talk about this all the time, where, you know, as people of color, as women of color, we, we, we have our emotions, but we don't want to hijack the moment. Um, but, but how do we do better and be, just be better? Um, and I guess the last thing I wanna, I wanna say there is how do we also at the same time deal with our guilt for normalizing all of this? Um, you know, I grapple with ideas of being a model minority um, and, and, and have I sold out? Have I recolonized my practices? Uh, have I just recolonized my own mind um, through this? And I, I don't know what the answer is. I really, really genuinely don't. And um, yeah, I'll stop there, but I'm really keen to maybe, I don't know if people are having some reflections or thoughts they want to add either, you know, just unmute yourself or, or type it into the chat. But um, that was so, sort of, I mean, Panthea, please, please jump in. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just would love to um, maybe just folks take a moment to process. Um, we'd love to open up the space either via chat or by voice on anyone that would like to share. Um, I think something that I have been thinking a lot about, um, and we, we've talked about this, but um, I saw a really amazing talk I guess back in 
late last year, maybe November of last year. And the title of the talk was literally called Fuck Empathy. And it was by this woman, um, this art historian named Aruna D'Souza. And there was a, a light bulb that went off in me uh, because those that know me know that my career, and especially in the last 10 years, has been um, basically, basically I've been like little Miss Empathy. You know, I've been, hey, if I just go and, you know, do the good ethnographic work, do the good design work, and I present these stories and I tell them, and yes, like all the personas and data, whatnot, if I just get people to care enough, if I just get people to care enough to see the injustice and to see the discrimination that they contribute to, surely they will do the right thing. Um, and Irina D'Souza's talk was basically, um, she, she kind of stood on stage and she said, you know, as a brown woman, I do not have the time to wait for the personal growth and development of, she said, sort of rich white men far away for it to be okay for me to exist, for me as a brown woman to thrive. Um, and there was something about that moment, um, A, because I think so much of my practice, you know, and some, so much of my sort of days have been sort of haunted by and thinking about how do, you just, how do I just build different empathy? How do I, you know, um, and if I just worked harder and did more and, just, you know, then I would get them to care. And that kind of shattered for me. Um, And, and then I think just, you know, in the past week or so, I'm not sure if folks have been following the hashtag publishing paid me on Twitter. Uh, you've seen a lot of different writers talk about what um, the amount of their advances that they have received for their different books. And not shockingly, you are seeing a gross disparity between uh, writers, uh, of color and white writers um, amongst men and women. And of course, sort of advances do not, advances are not about the quality of a piece of writing. Um, it, is, it is really just about market demand. Um, it, and it is in a larger sense about what voices we value, what voices we will give stage to. Um, and then not shockingly, I think as some more analysis of the New York Times bestsellers, um, I think 70% of them are, um, are white writers. Uh, I think 10% are black. Uh, I think uh, for East Asians, I think it's like 6%, something like that. Um, and you know, you can look at the, but everyone else had kind of like four or 5%. Um, and it also just made me feel really stupid made me feel really stupid and really guilty. Um, because it made me feel like I had made false promises or um, to, I think, communities and spaces that I had um, spent time in, lived in, worked, worked amongst to, you know, um, collect their stories, to harvest their stories, to, you know, think about how we could do different. And A, I thought when I saw those numbers in such stark black and white, and also, you know, I just thought, no one cares. And then B, I kind of thought to myself, you know, um, why did I think my voice in these rooms would matter either? And I think so I was sort of processing that at two levels. Um, and I was sort of furious with myself. Um, and I think some of this um, as a sort of as an Asian person gets back to um, the sort of model my, my minority myth. Um, and what, how much I have sort of played into that. Um, and therefore, you know, been complicit in the embedded um, structural biases of the institutions that I, that I work for and serve. And so I'm, I'm kind of in a, in, a, in a searching place at the moment. Um, and uh, I, I reacted emotionally when you were saying that, um, you know, when I started working in futures at, um, in, in foresight, 
um, and I, I've said this to a few intimate friends, um, how do we, I would find myself in, and so these are people that are tasked with helping groups, institutions reimagine the future and reimagine visions, et cetera. But I would find myself in groups where I'm the, A, the only woman, definitely the only person of color. Um, and to even break into that, to even consider a different lens. And in my life over the last few years where I've been either on, you know, delivering something on keynote, on stage, blah, blah, blah. And I would have people say to me, I never thought I would see somebody that looks like you doing the work that you do. And so there's a, there's a, there's a double thing, right? You feel the pressure of representation. I have to, someone said to me you've, recently this year, actually, for, for something that I was doing, Arati, I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. You've got a seat at the, at the table. That's amazing. Make sure you're using it well. Um, you know, you're, um, you're, you're representing so many of us and, and, and we've put our, uh, you know, we were all behind you. Um, but that is huge. And my experience doesn't speak to everybody else, but isn't it so fucking sad that in this day and age, somebody can say, I never thought I would see somebody that looks like you doing the work that you do. And I'm still like Panthea, you know, we failed. Pe poor people are still poor. People still, still can't access healthcare. People still die. Um, um, there's a question here from Andrew. Structures beget behaviors. Do we need different people in positions in the existing power structures or do we need different structures and processes of power altogether or both? How do we design, build, build systems that are decented? And is this even a useful question? I, I think it is. Thank you, Andrew. I think, I personally, I think we need different structures and different processes of power. We need different ways in which we're making decisions. We need different people that are in those decision-making roles. Um, but, you know, maybe we can hear from other people in, in the room as well about, about their thoughts. And totally okay if you don't have any. Well, it's maybe in my experience, I think I really agree that we need different structures because from my experience, I just don't think the incentives are big enough for kind of the existing positions to, to, to change that. Right. So I guess sort of like, I've been struggling with this idea sort of like the rebel or something sort of revolutionary. Right. And there just seems to be so many kind of like, there just seems to be so much rebelling going on. It's kind of like reinforcing the existing structures and kicking against it a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But just doesn't seem like anything kind of fundamental changes, right? So I don't know, like I, <laughs> I definitely don't know the answer, but um, I think I'm struggling with the same question you have, Andrew, um, around sort of like, I guess it was my, my struggle in the beginning as well, sort of like, do you just legitimize sort of like that existing structure if you work within it, maybe to sort of like create like, um, you know, the participation, ownership, decision making of different kind of people with different type of, from different type of places and backgrounds in, in different positions, or does it just need to be something altogether and do we all just need to leave it, <laughs> you know, and focus our energy on something different? And Marie, if I can just come back to that, I think you, you, you said something right at the end, do we all just have to leave it, you know, in the aid and development sector, oh my God, you know, we have been saying we want to talk ourselves, work ourselves out of a job forever. That is the biggest con line ever. Nobody wants to work themselves out of a job. And I, I you know, this, for, for those of us that are working in social change, our idea of ourselves, our concepts of I are so caught up in the, I, in the work that we do. You know, it's not, it's not just the job that we do. Our sense of self is caught up with it. So when you're asking us to change, or when you're asking other people to change, to shift, you're not, it's not something extrinsic. It's something you're, you're asking people to fundamentally stop doing what it is that they is tied up with their sense of self, their sense of identity of who they, who they are in the world and the space that they inhabit. And, and, and um, that's really hard. You know, I, I don't know if we're talking ourselves out of a job. 
I would just want us to think about how do we do, for, do our jobs differently when, when we don't have to, if, I, if we didn't have to take up the space of being the leader all the time, what would that look like? If you are holding, if you have the power of privilege and you can shift that, but by shifting it, it meant you weren't the one whose name got to be on the, um, the, the written pieces or get asked to keynote, you were really in the background. What your job was doing was facilitating funding flows, facilitating platforms. Would you be okay with that? Would you be okay taking a smaller role in order to amplify the space for others? Um, and, and I'm not saying you as in anybody in particular, I'm saying this for all of us. Are, can we do that? Can we actually reimagine our roles in the world um, and to use our power for, in a different way? It, can we let, let, let it go? I, I don't, in my experience and part of my anger and grief is because I don't actually think we can, but how do we do that? How do we leverage this moment of learning and unlearning that we're going through to also learn and unlearn a different, that it's okay to have smaller roles, but, but doing it in different ways. And I think the system that we work in doesn't, um, you know, I think, Henry, to your point, doesn't encourage that. I think um, it doesn't incentivize that, you know, um, as someone who, um, very much enjoys being behind the scenes. I think, you know, I think especially lately as we're trying to organize around some bigger efforts, um, there's been a, you know, uh, people want like a founder, they want a person, they want, and then they want those people to look a certain way and talk a certain way and to say, you know, with confidence, this is what the solution is. My, my general orientation is like, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm sure we could figure it out together. People don't like that, you know. <laughs> People want the solution. Um, I was at a I was at a book writing workshop where the um, the um, the sort of uh, people from publishing were just infuriated that I wouldn't give them sort of one answer as to how we were going to solve the problems of global development. <laughs> and you know, I wanted to explore with nuance and complexity and whatnot. And they're like, "This is not going to sell." And then I was like, "Well, and also like I, I I'd be really curious to think about sort of." you know, distribution sort of, you know, around the world. They're like, no, we're only looking at US and UK markets. You know, this is this is who we're writing for and we need the sort of big solutions. We don't have time or, you know, we don't have the space. The market doesn't want to grapple with complexity. And I think sort of to Andrew's question, um, I mean, Andrew, you have written books and, um, and, you know, thought a lot about this space. I think, you know, one thing that I, um, I, I don't think this is the, the answer at all. I think, yes, we need different systems. I think, yes, we need different leadership. I think, yes, some of us need to just get out of the way. Um, and, and I think sometimes that's, you know, that, that, that phrase, getting out of the way, can be triggering for people, you know, but I have value too. And absolutely. But I guess just what are the different roles um, that we need? Um, what, are, what, are, what are the different roles um, that we should all play? How do we then sort of understand and hold and be very satisfied with, that, that, that piece that is ours. Um, what is the role, and, I, and I've been thinking a lot lately also around um, what, what changes do we need in the, in the media space that sort of frame um, our understanding of reality and who sort of, you know, the, the, I think it perpetuates the sort of hero savior complex, um, the class divisions, I mean, the race divisions have come up, but the class divisions in the media are um, not examined nearly enough. So there was a great piece in the New York Times yesterday um, looking exactly at this very question, um, you know, here in New York, which is a major publishing media hub, um, as, you know, it's gone into sort of pandemic and then protest mode, um, all the executives are in the, in the Hamptons. What does that then do to also our understanding of, um, or you know, the 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 coverage that we're seeing of how change is happening? You know, the media has incentive to show the violent protests, the burning police cars. That you know, yes, that is happening. But there's also beautiful moments of solidarity and healing and coming together. And we are not seeing that in the global media. Um, and I think that's really problematic. Um, so, yeah. I'm, I'm conscious about time and I know we've only got a few minutes. Um, so I guess I maybe wanted to, um, there was a question Panthea and I wanted to ask and which is, you know, what is, what is the type of world that we would like to birth through this? Um, how can we design a world in which many worlds fit? 
it's not just one homogenous vision of the future. How do, we, how do we articulate with intent our assumptions as we go through this? How do we understand what we are not seeing and, and how, do we, how do we give space uh, for, for people to, to have their truth and have their life in these new visions and reimaginings of, of, you know, particularly in this point of time that, that we're having? Um, how do we how do we handle the truth of that? So I guess that's the question um, I wanted to to pose uh, that we wanted to pose, which was around what is what is the world that that we want to birth, and how do we have that be a, a world of justice and equity? And not at the expense or destruction of other people, I should say. Um, any last thoughts or words where we've got one minute more? It's difficult with that kind of a question, I think, to, to, to kind of end up on, on that. But I, I also think it's a, it's, a, it's a right question to end on. Uh, I think this was amazing. But thanks, both of you, for your honest and open sharing and uh, with such important experiences and questions, um, which has been a great contribution to the festival. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. And thank you for joining us in, in a very sh raw sharing. Um, and thanks Panthea, Jasper and, and Nicole. Thanks so much for hosting. And thanks everyone for coming. Take care. Thank you. Thanks everybody.